Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes, excellent, good. No, I can't hear you. You can't hear me, okay. Maybe I need to speak a little bit louder. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Very good. Okay, um, let's just sit for a moment or two and arrive. I have personally been rushing about to get here. So I need to just gather myself for a moment or two. And uh, maybe other people are in a similar situation. So let's just allow our weight to rest down onto the surface that we're sitting upon or lying upon. Allowing the eyes to lightly close if that's comfortable. And seeing if we can allow the out breath to go all the way out and the in breath to flow in in its own time. And remembering back to the four diaphragms from yesterday. Let's see if we can allow these to participate in breathing. A sense of openness and softness in the whole body. and inviting everything into awareness. If there's any discomfort, any pain, any emotional resistance or mental agitation, <clears throat> everything is welcome into this soft and yielding field of awareness. Yielding the whole body up to gravity. So we're held and supported. Seeing if we can allow our awareness to be broad and open and receptive. So we're not pushing and pulling against experience. And if we notice the push me pull you mind with good humor, we can release around it, releasing back into body awareness, releasing back into breathing as an anchor for the mind. So what we're inviting is a sense of wholeness, a sense of presence. Here we are in this moment, in this life, resting 
in the body, in the moment. Okay, so let's open the eyes, move the body however we want to, and bring the practice to a close. So lovely to see you all out there, out there and in here. We are all out there and we are all in here in our hearts. So I'm practicing Lo Jong this morning. <laughs> it's been a comedy of errors. So um, printers run out of toner. So here I was being all prepared and controlling, I know what I'm going to say, and then I print it all out at the very last minute and I can't really read any of it. So that's an adventure to share with you all. And then my body is, um, well, we're doing mindfulness of the body today. And I've had a body practice because my, um, I've got a paralyzed bowel. It makes it a bit of an adventure every morning having an evacuation and that has not gone to plan. <laughs> so I was on the loo at 25 passing. Oh my God, what am I going to do? Anyway, here I am. So that's exciting. I'll share with you these intimate details. Yeah, so I was, I, I had my laptop in the loo with me, as you do, in my second office. Print it out thinking that's good. And now I go to the printer and I can't read any of it. This is the practice. This is why I'm sharing this with you because this is exactly what we're being taught in, um, well, Satipatthana practice to be aware of what's happening and then the Lojong practice to welcome, welcome in the unexpected that I could call adversity, but I could also just call it, oh gosh, this is what life's dropped into my lap right now. That's exciting. How am I going to respond to this? And then life becomes, it does become an adventure actually, you know, and I'm sort of, I was aware of pounding heart and slightly stressy. And then some thoughts around, oh my God, it's all terrible. And then, you know, I bring awareness to that and I think, oh, it's not Vijayamala, it's fine. These are all nice people. You know enough, it'll be fine. Just go with the flow. Stay good humoured. I think this is a really important and quite delightful aspect of deepening practice is that um, we can laugh alongside life a little bit more. I mean, probably 10 years ago, this would have been a catastrophe in my situation. <laughs> I would have been completely stressed out. Whereas now I think, oh, yes, this is what the Buddha taught, that life is uncertain and unpredictable and unsatisfactory on its own level. And um, I do feel I do feel kind of weirdly delighted by it because my controlling mind has been utterly thwarted. And that's good. That's a good thing because even the idea that we can control life is totally ludicrous. We can have huge um, impact on how we respond to life. So we can control, if you like, our response to life. And that is the practice. But we can't. We can't control what happens. And I, again, I think this global pandemic is such a wonderful teaching in that respect, which is why I'm increasingly seeing it as an inside practice, because collectively we are all experiencing what the Buddha's taught. You know, we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised. And yet, probably most of us have been 
most of us probably think, oh, it shouldn't be like this. But why not? Why not? This is the way life is very unpredictable and uncertain. So learning how to kind of ride the waves, that's the, that is the practice. And um, another sort of slogan that I'm taking out of the pandemic for myself is to take, take life seriously, hold it lightly. Take life seriously, hold it lightly. Because it is serious. People are dying. People are ill. People have lost their jobs. It's terrible. And we need to take that very seriously, not trivialize that. It is a predicament. We are all in a predicament. So to have a deep heart, a deep hearted response to that. And at the same time, hold it all very lightly. You know, everything's coming and going, everything's changing. Nothing actually has independent existence in the way that we assume that it does anyway. Um, so maybe, yeah, I, I, I hadn't intended to say any of this, of course, but maybe what I'm just going through myself is a wee bit like that. So take it seriously in the sense that, you know, for myself right now, take it seriously in the sense that there's 128 people out there, well, 127, excluding me, who have all given your time and your attention and your own efforts to be here on time, 10.30 in the morning on a Sunday. You, many of you will have had to manage complexity to do that. And I honor and I respect that completely. So I need to take that seriously. I want to take that seriously. And holding lightly the fact that it's all been a bit of a catastrophe in my own particular world this morning. So hold all that lightly. You know, so what? doesn't matter. Here we all are turning our minds to the Dharma. That's what's important. And I really love that dance of incredible um, sincerity, you know, taking, taking life very seriously. If people turn to you and suffering, meet that with a very sort of serious heart and at the same time always bringing perspective and the perspective enables us to hold it lightly yeah I think the Dalai Lama is always a fantastic role model for this because clearly he takes life very very seriously and yet he's got that laugh hasn't he you know he's he's got that incredibly infectious laugh and you get the sense here's a man where you get the sense that life doesn't stick to him life is just sliding off. You know, he's, he's able to have this incredible flexibility of mind and you get the sense he is resting in this vast, broad, luminous awareness. So life comes along and he responds to the suffering of beings with incredible seriousness and all the time he's reminding us, hey, you know, nothing is what, nothing is the way it seems. And, um, Laugh. <laughs> I think laughter is an underestimated quality as well. All right then. So what was I going to say this morning? Pause. <laughs> okay, it's coming back to me. So today we're looking at mindfulness of the body in this first section, mindfulness of the body. And then in the second section, we're going to look at how we can develop deep, deep empathy for the fact that other people also have bodies and their experience of their body is going to be very similar to our own experience of our body. And um, of course, usually we're just very strongly oriented around our own body and then other people are just objects if we're honest. So how can we make that shift? But I'll come on to that after the break. So initially, we're going to do some training in how to be aware of the body. And this is the first section of the Satipatthana Sutta. In the Sutta, it's got six sections. It's got mindfulness of breathing, mindfulness of four postures, which is sitting, walking, standing, and lying down, which we can take to mean mindfulness of all postures at all times. It's got mindfulness of activities, walking to and from, putting on your robe, um, how you carry your begging bowl, all these kind of things. So we can take that in the modern context to be mindfulness, mindful of all of our activities of daily life. So it's mindfulness at all times and mindfulness in all postures. 
Then the fourth section is mindful, mindfulness of anatomical parts. And there's a great long list of the inner and outer body. You know, the sort of like the skin, but then also the guts and the phlegm and the spit and the blood and the snot and the urine. It goes through absolutely everything. And then there's mindfulness of the elements, earth, water, fire and air, which is showing us that this body is actually just a flow of the elements. And then there's mindfulness of the decomposition of the corpse, which is of course a very, very strong insight practice. Uh, traditionally people would go to the charnel grounds and meditate on rotting bodies um, as a way of lessening attachment to this, this form. The ones that we're going to particularly focus on is mindfulness of breathing, mindfulness of postures and mindfulness of activities. My own sense doing a lot of this teaching to Westerners is that this is a really great place to start because a lot of us, we're not very embodied. Um, and a lot of us have also got poor self view. So things like meditating on the decomposition of the corpse can just promote self-loathing, which is clearly not at all what's intended. So I think again, we can approach it very pragmatically, very practically, very simply. What does it mean to be embodied? How can I be embodied? Really, that, that is what this practice is about. And why is mindfulness of the body considered to be important? Um, there's somebody sitting here in the waiting room. I'm just wondering, is a tech person going to admit this person or should I do that? Um, I haven't got anybody in the waiting room. Oh, I've got Sarah Palmer entered the waiting room. Yeah, no, it's, <clears throat> it's fine, Vidya If there's anybody to admit, I can do it. So don't worry. Okay, I did just admit her then. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, where was I? Yes. Um, mindfulness of the body and why is it important? Well, again, I think my intention for this week, my wish for this week is to keep things simple. Um, I don't think we need to overcomplicate our Dharma practice. And mindfulness of the body is simple, is important simply because we have a body. We are, all of our experience takes place in the body. And it's a very Western concept of mind and body being divided. It goes back to Descartes. But traditionally, you know, the mind and the body are seen as um, completely uh, um, the same experience. And that's why yesterday when we were coming into the head and the brain, I said to see the head as a limb of the body. I think that's really helpful. So we've got the arms as limbs, the legs as limbs, and we've got the head as a limb. And so this idea that somehow you can have your experience in your head separate from your body is deeply deluded. But I think many of us in the West, we do have that, that kind of error of perception where the body is just this kind of boring thing that we cart around in our life. And really the, the interesting stuff is happening in the head. But that is a that is an error of perception because the head is part of the body everything is taking place in the body our senses are in the body and our sensory experience is experience is, it comes into the body it affects our body and all the contraction and the aversion and the craving that is also felt in the body so it's really really important i can't i can't express how important it is to become embodied and to be aware of the body. It's also very helpful because um, one of the ways we're wired up is if we're in touch with the body as an experience, not as an idea, but as an experience. And I'll say more about that in a moment. You know, if our awareness is absorbed in sensation, in fact, that's all of us now, let's just feel the bottom on the chair or if you're lying on the bed, feel your back on the bed. So really feel into that. And as soon as you do that, you're in the moment because the only time you can feel those sensations directly is now. Previous sensations are an idea, future sensations are an idea. The only time we can directly experience it is now. And what you'll also notice is if your awareness is occupied with that experience of the bottom on the chair, 
you cannot be lost in thought in exactly the same moment. We, we just can't do that. So it's wonderful. But a very good way to interrupt um, mental fabrication, propuncture, getting swept away is simply to come into sensation in the body. And as soon as we do that, we're present. And that mental train has been interrupted, even if just for a moment. So mindfulness of the body is also a brilliant way to train the mind and to keep calling the mind back to direct experience. And then we learn to care for the body. Again, this is really important. I think for many of us in the West who we have this kind of duality of head and body or mind and body, we think the mind's interesting and we treat the body like a machine. We don't really care about the body. It's, it's just a kind of, um, you know, it's much less important than the mind and it's something we drag through our lives. So a really important aspect of mindfulness of the body is to learn to care for the body, to love the body. You know, it's a wonderful vehicle through which we can practice the Dharma. It's an essential vehicle through which to practice the Dharma. It's a precious treasure. So to value and appreciate the body and to care for it because a body that's restful, at ease, as relaxed as possible is going to be a, a much better basis for resting back in broad open awareness than a body that's really tight and stressed and tense. So this kind of softening and resting, softening and resting in the body will also have a, an effect on the mind. Okay. So let's do a little breathing practice together, which again, we'll be following on from yesterday and following on from what we did at the beginning. And my wish here is that you will find um, some richness that you can take into your mindfulness of breathing practice. Because obviously the mindfulness of breathing is one of the core practices in Tree Ratna, which is brilliant. And it's you know, a very good way of cultivating calm, shamatha. Um, but I think many of us have got some habits around the way we do the mindfulness of breathing that are not particularly helpful. Uh, for example, we might watch the breath. Sometimes we even use this language of watching the breath. And that means we're kind of out here somewhere watching the breath from the outside. So uh, what I'd like you to have an experience of is to inhabit the breathing body to rest deeply inside the breathing body so you're resting inside the experience of breathing directly and that will make the mindfulness of breathing a more interesting practice and during this practice i'll also invite you to notice where is your interest around your breathing because the mind goes to what it's interested in so our task, if you like, our invitation is to make breathing really, really interesting, to make it more interesting than our juicy distractions. So let's just have a moment to um, change our posture. If you, want to, if you want to stand up for a moment, have a stretch, whatever. So very, very good to move the body regularly. I think I'm gonna stand up for a moment and then establish your meditation posture.
Okay, if we settle down into our position. So there's been a question about the volume on the chat box. Is maybe a few people could just say whether the volume's all right. Looks like most people are finding it okay. All right, good. Looks like it's it's okay because I don't want people sort of straining to hear because that's irritating. It's all very well bringing adversity onto the path, but it's also really great to, if you can solve a problem simply, then it's always good to solve that problem. You don't need to actually go actively looking for problems. Okay, so let's just settle into our position. Closing the eyes slightly. And just imagine that you're settling down for your regular mindfulness of breathing practice. So you can get the felt sense in this practice that you can take into your daily practice. And the first thing to do is to allow the body to rest and to settle. So feeling down into the points of contact between the body and the surface it's resting upon, the feet and the floor. And if it would be helpful, you could take a deeper breath in and then letting go on the out breath. <sighs> Doing that a few times. This can help sometimes just to help us arrive, let go of tension. Breathing out through the mouth. <sighs> and now allowing the breathing to settle. Allowing your breathing to find its own natural rhythm. Being curious about how breathing is expressing itself in the whole body. We're just going to do what would be the third stage of the mindfulness of breathing in your daily practice. So we can have a taste of whole body breathing. So we're not watching breathing from the outside. We're not analyzing breathing. We're not thinking about breathing, but we're resting inside the felt experience of breathing deep in the body. Allowing the body to swell a little bit on the in-breath and subside a little bit on the out-breath. Being careful not to force or strain or get tangled up with willful breathing. So we're resting in gravity, resting back in the whole body and allowing breathing to express itself naturally, however it is for you at this moment. Breathing's feeling agitated around the chest area, then you can drop deeper in the body or drop into the back of the body. Resting inside the movements and the sensations of breathing in the body.
every time your mind wanders, in the noticing that you've wandered, you're succeeding in your mindfulness practice and you have this magical moment of choice and you can choose to shift your awareness back inside breathing, inside the body, inside sensation, inside movement. Remembering that we can't be inside the direct experience of the body and lost in thinking at exactly the same moment. So using breath awareness, body awareness as an anchor for the mind again and again. You might like to check in on the five Bs of the breath I mentioned yesterday, the five areas starting with B. There's the buttocks. Can the buttocks be soft, restful? The whole back of the body soft, participating in breathing. The belly soft, swelling, subsiding, swelling, subsiding. base of the skull soft so the throat area can be soft so the wind of the breath can flow freely through this area and the brain soft restful in its little cradle in the head Bringing a warrior heart to this present moment awareness of the body of breathing, feeling the courage it takes to stay present, the bravery it takes to stay present with whatever's arising. and the confidence that builds when we know we can stay present, even if just for a moment, we can meet our life with presence. Grounded in the body, grounded in breathing, grounded in each present moment. And is there any particular aspect of breathing that is engaging your interest? 
And if you're finding it a bit dally or drifting a lot, and seeing, is there anything in your breathing, in your experience of breathing that could engage your interest? Maybe the duration of each breath, the in-breath and the out-breath. Or the location, where in your body is it most interesting? Or the quality, is it rough? Long, smooth, silky, jagged. Letting go of any judgment and simply being curious, interested. Or maybe where the breath turns is particularly interesting. The delicacy where the in-breath becomes the out-breath. The delicacy where the out-breath becomes the in-breath. Are you trying too hard? Would it help if you relaxed a little bit more? Or are you very drifty and would it help if you focused a little bit more? Being interested all the time in our quality of awareness as we rest inside breathing inside the body. What's happening now? If you've wandered far away, then in the noticing, you're mindful. And choosing to invite awareness back inside, breathing inside the body. If you're pushing against experience, then releasing, relaxing. <coughs> Excuse me. So taking this breathing body into a little bit of movement. What's your body calling for? 
You might want to stretch. Good. So I'm very curious to know what was happening out there, what people noticed or what your experience was. So we're going to try doing a little bit of inquiry. If you look at the reaction button on your screen, it's a raise hand option. And if you raise your hand, if you'd like to share anything, anything that you noticed in that practice, um, then when your hand goes up, I'll know who you are. I hope. Oops. Okay, Joe, if you unmute yourself. Hey. Um, I'm kind of it, at the edge of my practice at the moment seems to be awareness of awareness. And I got this kind of sense of um, a kind of task for me is to bring awareness from up here right down to my perineum and it kind of grew it grew from here and then it I noticed that my throat is always closed I do have a thyroid problem so it's kind of there's a blockage here it feels like maybe that could be a story and that the awareness got down from here to about my belly button and I could drop it down and then kind of bring it back up again you can't see the bottom of my hand it's doing this so there was how big my field of awareness within my body was, is what I'm trying to say. Mm. That. Yeah, good. Thank you. So how, what was the process of allowing your field of awareness to grow? Um, yeah, the process was coming back to breath and coming back to the body every time. Um, I'm quite uptight this morning. I'm irritated. I'm feeling menopausal. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be doing this. So I had to really stay with it, you know, um, to really kind of and not push too hard. So yeah, breath, breath, body, breath, body, breath, body, back, back. Okay, chattering mind, dishwasher delivered, teenagers, you know, whatever. <laughs> back to the body. Want to go sledging? <laughs> back to the body and eventually I let go you know and it builds okay so what's your experience at the end compared to at the beginning having gone through that journey um there's still tightness here I'm still a bit reactive I'm answering a bit quicker than I normally do um but there's there's certainly more softening in my body and in my mind my mind is just a little bit more relaxed hmm. Less, less metal. I felt I could even taste metal at what before we started. It was like it was metallic. It was so brittle in my mind. Yeah. Um, and that's changed. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah interesting. So I thought uh, you've also described bringing um, the difficulty into your practice really well, which is the other sort of dimension yeah. that we're bringing out on this retreat. Um, you know, the irritation the brittleness um you know you could have thought i'm not gonna even bother turning up this morning because i don't feel in the right conditions to meditate you know that's what we can do sometimes isn't it we think oh i don't want to meditate today because i'm feeling too irritable whereas what you've described as bringing your irritation into the practice and it's transformed to some extent which is the I'm practice a warrior video. pardon <laughs> I'm a warrior. <laughs> you are. That is the warrior stance. Really Brilliant. That's, my, that's the good thing about being a warrior is having that energy behind things like take it on, you know, shoulder down. Let's do this. There's nothing else to do. Yeah. You know, I'm so inspired by the Dharma. There is nothing else to do. And that's interesting because you also noticed from what you said that you were a bit pushing against the breath to then you had to relax and soften, which is also the warrior stance which I think is sort of mm. a bit counterintuitive. We can think warriors are just kind of, I got their spears, but the warrior stance is also to 
recognize, oh, I need to relax a bit more broad and open, soften. That's a very brave thing to do for many of us. Good, thank you very much, Joe. Yeah, yeah. lovely. <laughs> so maybe one more person. I think you, do you put your hand down or do I put your hand down? Oh, you put your hand down, that's good. So, mm, yeah, one more person. If anyone else wants to share anything. I know it's a bit scary talking in front of 100 people. I share something? Um, yes. Manjinda here. Um, yeah, I had this real um, sense of um, contraction at the front of my body on the in-breath. And then um, my practice is to go to the back of my body. Um, and there were times where it was forceful and there were times where it was more like, you know, when you watch birds and they have that lovely kind of, um, yeah, it's really graceful, like a heron or something when they when they kind of do that thing and it's like really lovely. Um, but it was mixed in between a very willful pushing it to the back of my body, it retracting forwards. Um, yeah, so I was really aware of that um, as, as an area of interest um, for me, um, because I kept it sort of, I'd, I'd drift to another part of my body or get distracted in a mind event um, and then come back to that. Um, it's, you know, that refrain that, that that is always there for me, that thing of, um, yeah, so I'm, so I'm doing it because it's like hard to describe it because it's almost, it is a felt sense. Um, and when it does it um, like a bird, it does, it feels really lovely. Um, but then there's a part of me that wants that, that is willful around that wanting pleasure. I don't know if that makes any sense. It does, it does, yeah, thank you very much. So I think what you're describing there is also something many of us um, uh, do. You know, you, you have, you've had an experience in the past of coming to the back of the body and it being really pleasurable, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're sort of striving to have that again and then it gets a bit strivey and then you close down around it and then you try to have that again is that I can't quite I don't I can't see you I'm not so sure where you are this is quite interesting talking to someone that you can't see <laughs> <laughs> it's quite challenging it's interesting. <laughs> um so when you noticed you were getting a bit strivey what did you do I well I I kind of, um, let me just think back. Sorry, I'm just going to go back to my mind, <laughs> what I was doing. I kind of breathed, I breathed, I breathed into that. And then I had this memory of, of seeing this heron um, in that, in that graceful, in that graceful posture kind of thing that I, yeah, I, I live on the first floor and I see birds at that point. I see that underneath birds <laughs> um, mm. so I can kind of I know what, and when I see that in the world it it really I, I love yeah that brings me a sense of uh, yeah I'm very mindful in that moment when I see that so it's sort of my mind went back to that memory it went back to my back um, I suppose I breathed mm -hmm. um, yeah and and then what happened and then I went back to being willful again. <laughs> so I'm really curious about this willfulness. So you say willful, what was the actual, what, what was the experience that you're describing as willful? Um, because I can feel tension, I'm breathing willfully into the back of my body. Okay, because um, you're, you're wanting to have this kind of other experience. And I don't want to feel that tension um and because it, it constricts my breathing 
And so when and you maybe notice, maybe it's a positive use of willfulness. Um, maybe it's a skillful will. Yeah. So what was what was the result for you? What was the consequence for you? Um, the result was I, I did have that um, soft, uh, more flow, uh, more um, less laboured breathing. It, okay. Yeah. There, it was. It did feel more of a sense of flow, more of a sense of allowing, um, and then and then it goes into yeah a more constriction and then I get constricted and I have to do it again I have to go through that hole okay and and at the end of the practice how did you feel compared to at the beginning of the practice I felt really good because um this morning it's practice for me the what the bit I did on my own this morning um the three the the kind of the five areas of the body I kind of that, that made a lot of sense. And just the invitation to keep coming back to the body. I mean, it's not like I don't know this. Uh, you know, it's like just coming back to the body and reckon, yeah, not shaming myself around how long have I been practicing and I still can't do this thing. Um, yeah, that felt very um, connecting. And also I, yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. It and felt, at the end um, of at the end of this this set we've just done mm. when you were describing oh, i was being willful coming back in my body and i'm contracting i was willful did you feel a transformation at all by the end it sounds like you felt good at the end of it from what yeah you yeah i felt a bit of confidence in my practice i suppose that i'm not doing it wrong good, <laughs> that, good. That, you know yeah i suppose there's that element of it and that um good. I, yeah Thank you. So that is so. I think what you what what you, you've described yourself is a really helpful reframing of something that you were judging as willfulness. You could reframe it as skillful intention mm. that you do know what to do when you're tight and contracted. You know what's a helpful um, quality of awareness to introduce, which is oh, I need to rest back in my body and then crunch down, rest back, and. As a consequence of doing that, being very skillful and clear, we said yesterday, I said yesterday in the, in the Satipatthana, we know what's happening right now and we apply clarity and intelligence to our experience of what's happening right now. And you did that and the consequence was greater ease by the sound, like, by, by the sound of it. Mm. So that's really, that's a good, a good discovery because we, be, we can be so habitual and quick to judge Oh, I'm being willful. Therefore, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm a useless meditator, yada, yada, yada. Whereas actually it's like, oh, I do know what I'm doing and it's skillful intention and clarity and intelligence. And the consequence was feeling greater ease. Good. That's, that's really helpful for all of us. I'm sure to hear that. Thank you. All right then, so now we're going to move into mindfulness of postures and mindfulness of activity in the break. So it's not a break from mindfulness, it's, but it's an opportunity to have mindfulness of moving the body through space to the kettle. Putting the kettle on. I'd really encourage you to wait for the kettle to turn itself off before you make your drink. That's a very demanding practice for most of us. And notice the breath holding and the frustration that goes on. Jolly kettle, why is it boiling so long before it switches off? Experience drinking your tea. If you eat something, really experience that. And then we'll come back and report back out what we noticed. Now this, and, and of course, for most of us, probably depending on our house, we may have to go through a door at some point in the break. There might be a door between where we are now and our kitchen, or we might want to go to the loo, whatever. So I'd really like you to bring mindfulness to opening and closing the door. You could even do it a few times just for fun. And in particular, I'd like you to notice, do you hold your breath before you do an activity, such as opening and closing the door? And do you over effort? Do you put more effort into most of your activities than is really necessary. So you'll have quite a lot of activities probably. There'll be the kettle, lifting up your cup, drinking, eating, opening a door, going to the loo, pulling your 
closed down, pulling them up again. There's lots of activities now. And the, the inquiry is, am I holding my breath on more than I need to? And am I using more effort than I need to? So this is a little voyage of discovery for 15 minutes. And then we'll come back at quarter two for the next session. So see if you can experience, you're, a, you're an um, explorer in a, you've just discovered this new land of your house and you are going into it for the first time with this mind. You've never done it with this mind ever before and treat it like an adventure. So see you soon. Welcome back. Um, Maitri Matti is just gonna um, say something about how to use the raise hand symbol. Yep. Some people got a bit um, used the wrong symbol before. Yeah, thanks Vidyamala. So um, if you go into the reactions button on the bar, um, then you'll see that there's some symbols um, where you see the pictures like the clapping hands or the thumbs up. Um, so it, those ones won't work because it doesn't bring you up on the participants list. So we, it's difficult to see that you've clicked on that. But um, right at the bottom of that box, you see it says the words raise hand um, and there's a picture just by it. And Joe's managed to um, do it and Mo's managed to do it. Yeah, so hey. if anyone wants to raise their hand now, so we know that it's all working. <laughs> Brilliant. And then what it does is it orders them in the order that somebody's raised their hand. So it's very useful for us. Um, so that's the button to press in these inquiries. Yep. Great. Thank you. <laughs> and then you need to lower your yeah. hand as well. <laughs> now you need to lower your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. A masterclass and something that is potentially very simple in a complex life. So Emma's yeah, saying I haven't sorry. got that one. Oh, no, I haven't either. It's far as I have. Are you on an iPad or a computer? Uh, I'm on a laptop. Yeah, so I have I've a just laptop got... too and I haven't yeah. got it. Yeah, maybe I've just you, got a little row. So maybe what you could do is um, this afternoon, make sure you've got the latest version of Zoom, do an update. Mm -hmm. Excuse it me, um, it can be on participants as well. If you go along to the participants, that has a blue raised hand if you've got a laptop. That isn't the older version. That just appears when you are. Yes, I've got the latest version and it seems to be a participants. Okay, so that makes it an adventure, like if <laughs> bring adversity onto the path in terms of how do you raise your hand on Zoom. So maybe this afternoon you could have a little play. Um, if, if at any point I say raise your hand if you want to share anything and you really want to share something and it's not working, just unmute yourself and start talking and it'll all be fine. We'll figure it out. Um, okay, so those of you who've got your hands raised now, you might like to, like to lower them. So that's Tina and Syria Dyer. Sorry to out you. <laughs> good. Okay, good. So, oh, yours is still raised, Syria Dyer. It's a very persistent hand, good. Okay, excellent. Um, Let's just have a, a few minutes hearing back what you noticed in the uh, breath holding effort, mindfulness of daily activities. So Laura, you want to say something? Yes, I had to unmute myself. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I found this um, exercise extremely um, fascinating. I live in a studio apartment, so during the break, I got myself off my seat to make myself a cup of coffee on my, with my Keurig. And I first heat my cup up. Uh, I fill it with water and then put the cup inside the microwave. And I noticed, the very first thing I noticed, as I put the cup inside the microwave and I pressed the button for two minutes, I was holding my breath already. And I asked myself, why am I holding my breath? And it was as though the image that I had in my head was um, 
when I'm excited or when we get excited about something and we're about to cheer, there's like a pause, like, oh, yay. And that's what it felt like to me. That was the image that I had in my head. And then I went to wipe my hands on the towel. I turned around and I went to wipe my hands on the towel because they were a little wet with water. And I held my breath. <laughs> and I asked myself, why am I holding my breath? Is this make it more, do my hands get drier faster when I hold my breath? <laughs> and then when I put the cup, when I was pouring the water on top of the, um, Keurig machine, I was holding my breath. And then I started to think, I paused and I said, how often am I holding my mm. breath? Yeah. And I'm holding my breath when I do an activity. Mm. And then I noticed I walked from the kitchen, which is not very far to my seat. And I went into my handbag to get out my lip gloss to, to, to uh, put lip gloss on my mouth. And as I was putting my hands into the side pocket, I was holding my breath. And the interesting thing is I have mild asthma and I've been having breathing problems so much so that I have to go to a cardiologist. And I thought this really interesting. Yeah. So I cannot come up with the answer why I'm holding my breath. And I'm sure you can enlighten me because this is really interesting. But I think it's more interesting for you to sit with the question and just really investigate your experience. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I think you will have the answer inside you. Um, you know, the more you can notice it, like when you noticed you were holding your breath, um, what, what happened, what, what did you do when you noticed you were holding your breath? What was your natural response? Why? What, what, no, when you noticed that you were, what was your natural no, I'm, The question was, why am I doing this? That was my response. I noticed it and I said- oh, I say yes. But what happened to your breathing? When you noticed you were holding your breath, what happened to your I breathing? I started breathing. Yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> that would be an interesting gonna, This is not gonna change the activity because I'm not breathing. <laughs> yeah. So just to keep on noticing you're holding your breath and then breathing and see what happens over time. And then you'll find out, you know, are you holding your breath for some clinical reason? Well, I have an idea. I have a sense. It's when I'm focusing. Yeah, well, that's so interesting. Like, why on earth do you hold your breath when you're focusing? That would be such a great thing just to explore for yourself. Okay. And the other thing I'd, I'd like to know is when you went for your lip balm and you were holding your breath, what was your effort like? Not, not very much. Not very much. Okay. So no, not, there wasn't at there... not at all. No, yeah. I knew where it was. It wasn't as though I was lifting five pounds. <laughs> but again, I think I'd really invite you to investigate when you're holding your breath. Right. Does that impact the way you move? Like, is it smooth or is it a bit more kind of labored because you're holding your breath? Just investigate that. Absolutely. Great point. Absolutely. Yeah. I absolutely will do this. Yeah. And everybody else who are listening, you know, really investigate that for yourselves. Yeah. So we'll just thank you very much, Laura. I would say, I've only got time for one more because I want to move on. But I think Tina was the next person who had her hand raised. I was just testing the hand raise thing. Because <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry, I mean, not, yeah. if, if there's someone behind me, I would like to give her that. But if not, I can always say something. I think it was another Tina. It was Tina. Oh, o it was another o Tina. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I just uh, really want to something uh, from the uh, meditation of breath because you said uh, the thing about not observing the breath but actually breathing. And um, when I sat down to meditate, I, I noticed that I think I have <laughs> been basing my mindfulness practice on this observer kind of point of view. Um, and instead of uh, meditating, I've been observing meditating. And instead of really sitting, I've been observing myself sitting. And uh, when I try to sort of uh, go deeper in that or, or sort of rest in that, uh, that it was actually me breathing 
I've I felt like I had this duality in me that I had this um, uh, distance from myself, and I think it's it feels like because I have I I struggle a little bit with um, low self esteem and feelings of being not good enough and being uh, worthless and sort of yeah, um, and it felt like I have have actually or my practice up to this point has actually been sort of um uh, supporting that view and it's mm. helped sort of helped me being uh, uh, observing myself instead of actually being in myself if you can yeah yes 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 that's very well explained yeah so today did you manage to be in yourself a little bit more Yes, and it was a very like new new feeling. I, I don't think I've ever done that before. Wow. <laughs> I'm only 35. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it was just uh, it was very like uh, it it was it felt like sort of a light bulb moment where I just it, it feels like it's a very deep thing, a very very like a very deep habit of keeping myself on a distance from myself and not really actually daring to be be the one breathing or being the breathing sort of yeah yeah great great and when you were being just being in yourself being in yourself um what was the effect on your confidence uh it, it felt very good actually mm. I wouldn't have guessed it, but yeah. it felt more like uh, I don't think it, I don't uh, or it was almost like it, there was no confidence. Uh, the confidence wasn't even there because it, it was just me. Yes. Sort of. There was no sort of question about. Yeah. Yeah. It was just a pause, some, some kind of pause or. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Because you can't get being you wrong if you're just resting inside yourself like that. Yeah. And I think as well, what you've described, thank you so much. That's very moving. And that is that warrior stance, you know, having the courage to, instead of keeping yourself a bit separate, like to drop inside and drop inside. And here I am. And this is my experience. And then the sense of freedom that comes with that. Mm. You've articulated that really well. well thank you. Uh, thank you for sort of showing me that. <laughs> yeah. I think it's very important. Mm. Good. And you're only 35, so you might have decades of being <laughs> in yourself. Yeah, there's a lovely that was, line. That from, was a joke. <laughs> I know, but I'm taking it seriously. Yeah, some of us, some people never had that experience in their whole life. Yeah, that's some, true. Probably many people never had that experience in their whole life. Yeah, there's a lovely line from a, a poem by James Joyce that says, Mr. Duffy, there's a character called Mr. Duffy. Mr. Duffy lived but a short distance from his body. <laughs> so he just went through his life you know here I am just slightly split off from my body I think many people live but a short distance from their body and we're learning how to there be no distance at all there's just experience yeah so thank you very much Tina thank you okay lovely um so I'm going to move on now to uh how do we use this awareness to um, unwind our habit of caring about ourselves more than others. And there's a, a lovely um, expression from one of the teachers, the mind training teachers. And he says that the, the mirror becomes the window. So what that means is what we've been doing in the practice so far today is in a way holding a mirror up to who we are and coming very deeply inside and beginning to rest much more deeply inside and to unwind some of the ways we contract around experience and split off from experience as Tina's just articulated so clearly. And now what we're gonna do is the mirror, it's a kind of magic mirror and it opens and it becomes a window and we're gonna raise our gaze and look through that window and we see billions of people that are just like us, billions of people that are breathing that are probably a bit split off from their bodies, that are longing for peace and ease and embodiment, yeah. So I love this image of the mirror becoming the window. So that's what we're doing now. Um, I'm just gonna show a few 
slides with some quotes and then we're going to do another practice. Can you see that okay? Mike Ramala, I can see you there. Put your thumb up if you can see that. Yes, excellent, good. Um, good, okay, so there's, as I said, this is a very widely practiced um, approach in Tibetan Buddhism, it comes from Mahayana Buddhism. And the main texts that people uh, practice or study is one by Langri Tampa, Langri Tampa, which is called the eight verses for training the mind. And he was a disciple, a disciple of a disciple of Atisha. So Atisha brought the teachings and then um, after a few generations, Langri Tampa articulated them in the eight verses of training the mind, very, very pithy, extremely challenging, most of them. Taking your enemy as your spiritual friend, that kind of thing. And then uh, a later version of that is the seven, seven point mind training by Geshe Chikawa. And that is 50, about 59 slogans. So this is really pithy. It's a way of um, bringing these very lofty teachings right down to earth. So a, one of the slogans is drive all blames into one. And what that means is the thing that the, the, the um, cause of all our suffering is self clinging. So don't blame other things, but turn inwards and eradicate or unwind your self clinging. Um, regard all phenomena as dreams. That's the slogan for the skylight mind. Rest in the nature of unborn awareness. Rest in the nature of all the basis of everything. So there's lots of different slogans and maybe over the week I'll introduce different ones of those. A lot of them are highly provocative, very challenging and they're designed to be thus to shake us out of our um, complacency. And there's a lovely story about how Geshe Chikawa came to came across these teachings. So he shared a room with another monk and he saw this line on the other monk's pillow. I offer all gain and victory to others, each and every sentient being. I accept all loss and defeat for myself. I mean, that's super challenging, isn't it, for us? <laughs> And he saw this and he was so deeply moved by just seeing this line that he traveled to seek out the teacher who was Langri Tampa. So he traveled a long way to try and find Langri Tampa. He got there and Langri Tampa had just died. So then he went to um, one of Langri Tampa's disciples, Geshe Shirawa, I think his name was. And he said, will you teach me? So he did teach him, Shirara taught him, and he stayed, uh, uh, Geshe Chikawa stayed there for 12 years, yeah, to learn the mind training. And then he wrote the seven point mind training with the 59 slogans. So I find that amazing. I mean, if I saw that, if I saw those lines on someone's pillow, I don't think it would send me on a quest. I'd just be exceedingly challenged and think I don't understand that. Um, but this is, this is seen as the real heart of the mind training, this verse. I offer all gain and victory to others, each and every sentient being. I accept all loss and defeat for myself. And one of the um, commentaries describes this quite simply because it can sound very strange, can't it? Does it mean you have to be a doormat? You just lie back and let everyone walk all over you because that's the way one could interpret it. Of course, it doesn't mean that. Remember, it's a training principle. It's not a metaphysical stance. But one of the commentators says it's a bit like you're on a bus and you're sitting down on a bus and somebody who's very elderly and disabled gets on the bus and you quite naturally give your seat up to that person. That's what this verse means. It's that natural response of you see someone else, another human being, and you give up what you have for their welfare in the sense of giving up your seat on the bus. So it's very practical, very immediate. It can also mean loss and de defeat of self-clinging. 
you know, I'm going to lose my sense of attachment to everything in me that I cling on to and defeat self clinging. And I'm going to do that by just continually offering things to others. And the transference of merit and self surrender verse in our puja is very much based on this ideal. In fact, I th I'm thinking we're going to start reciting that after every session during this retreat so we can really instill that spirit. Because in that verse, we, we talk about giving up everything, our possessions, our merit in all three ways, our personality, you know, very deep releasing, giving up for the sake of all beings. So really it's that that's the spirit, um, but a very challenging verse, of course. So I've just got some quotes, um, a few quotes to bring out the spirit of what we're talking about. Sorry, let me just go back. <clears throat> so Patrick Rinpoche, he's a great, oh goodness, what's going on? Sorry. Patrick Rinpoche is um, one of the great teachers of this. He made the Shant he made the Bodhicharya by Shantideva his main text, and he just taught that and practiced that all his life. There's an amazing book called Enlightened Vagabond, which is the biography of Patrick Rinpoche. If you want to read just a fantastic book about um, a really wild Tibetan hermit and his life. I found it completely captivating. Um, very, um, again, very sort of challenging his life, but really wonderful. And he used to just weep with his love for living beings. Um, I just need to try and move something on my screen so I can read this. Move that up there, I could. So the bodhicitta practice of exchanging oneself and others is the ultimate and unfailing quintessential meditation for all those who have set out on the path of the Mahayana teachings. Reject like poison the negative mentality which gives so much importance to yourself. So you could say exchanging self and other is shorthand for exchanging self clinging for other regarding this or being other regarding. So that's the practice, always moving from me, 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 me to we, 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 we. <laughs> Let's look at it that way. Because it's not, you, you're going beyond duality. So it's not, the training is to think of others and the outcome is a non-dual awareness where you realize that we're not ultimately separate anyway. But it's this, it's this antidote um, by always thinking of others as an antidote for self-clinging. Shantideva, whoever wishes quickly to become a refuge for himself and others should undertake this sacred mystery to take the place of others giving them his own or her own. I mean, you could reflect on that for the rest of your life and that would be a very rich and meaningful practice. And then there's, there's often this idea that you take on the suffering of others and you give them your um, merit. And so of course, a, an immediate question will be, well, why on earth would you do that to just add to your own burden? I've got enough suffering already, thanks very much. And he said, I should eliminate the suffering of others because it is suffering, just like my own suffering. I should take care of others because they are sentient beings, just as I am a sentient being. I really love that one. I think that's very, very deep. Like, why do we care about our own suffering more than others' suffering? Ask yourself that question. That's such a great question. Why? Why is my suffering more important than your suffering? Shantideva, all suffering arises through our self-grasping and self-concerns. All happiness comes from cherishing others. And this is very famous, this is very beautiful. Shantideva again. Although it has many divisions, such as its arms and so on, the body is protected as a whole. Likewise, different beings with their sorrows and joys are all equal like myself in their yearning for happiness. So this is very famous and I, I find this one um, evocative. It's, it's like I have a body that I think of as my body 
I think of it as a thing when I'm not being wise. Um, and if I hurt my left hand, it's very immediate for my right hand to reach across and soothe my left hand. It's totally immediate, isn't it? You know, a part of our body is hurt and other parts of the body come to the rescue. It's completely instinctive and immediate. And yet this thing I call the body is made up of all these myriad parts. Yeah. And yet there's this immediate response. We can see life like that rather than my body is myriad parts, life is myriad parts. You and I are like two different parts of um, life itself, shall we say. So wouldn't it be amazing if my response, if you have suffering, I just respond as immediately as my right hand responds to my left hand if it's hurting. Very, very beautiful, this idea that we're all participating in this incredible interconnected experience. Um, and that we can have the attitude to one another that one part of our body has to another part of the body when it's hurting. Patrol, completely eradicate all those wrong attitudes based on attachment and aversion, which makes you reject others and care only for yourself and think of yourself and others as being entirely equal. So that's very similar to the previous statement. You can see how these are very deep transformative teachings. I'll put all this um, on the um, Padlet board so you can look at them later as well. And this is, this is a nice summary from Alan Wallace who's written a book called Buddhism with Attitude on the seven point mind training. And as I said yesterday, the seven point mind training has got the view of the vast, luminous, clear, boundless, awareness which is called absolute bodhicitta or wisdom and then there's the mind training exchanging self and others which is um, how we work within our conditioned world in order to transform our mind so we can then release back into this big mind or vast awareness so the skillful means is the the training and the wisdom is the awareness and he says wisdom without skillful means compassion is bondage Skillful means without wisdom is bondage. Insight alone can get derailed, get derailed into an indifferent state of disengaged, uncaring, self-centered, barren, isolated inner peace. Compassion alone can lead to exhaustion and burnout. And balance is the central theme of the seven point mind training. So we're balancing uh, wisdom and compassion. And ba I, I believe balance is also a central theme of Satipatthana as well unpack over the week, um, the quality of awareness we're cultivating in Satipatthana is a middle way between suppressing our experience and getting over identified with our experience. So it's very, very similar to mind training in that respect or the Lojong training. It's this balanced, open, broad, receptive awareness. Okay, so those of you who've been writing all these down, if you if you haven't managed to get them all, then as I say, straight after the session, I'll put this on the Padlet board. Um, so let's do a little practice. Before that, I'm not something I meant to say at the beginning, but because my I lost all my notes, I forgot. And it's about how to approach this retreat and the main thing I'd encourage you to do is to relax. Um, obviously, I'm giving input. Uh, so there is a study element, um, but mainly it's, it's an opportunity to, to practice resting, resting in awareness, and to see how the information comes into your heart when you have a restful mind. And you can follow up all the references and stuff after the retreat if you want to. I mean, you can do it during the retreat if you want to, but sometimes that can become another form of craving. You know, we sort of want all the information, we want to understand it and we want to have it all nailed. And that can get in the way of just relaxing and awareness. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you're a, someone who goes for refuge to knowledge, you could actually have a bit of a go at just resting back 
see what happens. Yeah, but as I say, I'll put everything on the Padlet board. So, you know, you've got things to refer to if you want to. Okay, so let's do a practice together now, um, which will be where we bring to mind others, that others also have bodies and their experience of being embodied is in essence, very similar to our own. Um, maybe before we do this, let's, um, let's spend a few moments just looking. I really enjoy doing this, looking at the screen at all the people, scrolling through the pages. We've got five pages and imaginatively identifying. So they're, as I said yesterday, they're not just little postage stamps. There's actually 125 living beings out there. And every single one of us is as dear to ourselves as we are to ourselves. None of us likes to suffer. We all want to be happy. And it can be quite interesting just to gaze, and take in, see if you can really allow these other beings into the heart. Noticing any automatic preferencing, you know, I like the look of that person, I don't like the look of that person. Just notice all that stuff without judgment, that's what we do. See if we can soften it a little bit. We're sharing this experience with one another. Probably all of us have a tendency to over effort, hold our breath in all kinds of ways. And just notice, I mean, what I'm noticing in myself is as I, as the moments pass, something's happening to my awareness and I am actually like, oh yes, human beings not objects, human beings, how lovely. There's a sort of softening that's happening and a receptivity. So see if you can allow that. And if you find you're peering in, what's it like to lean back and let people in? And also what's happened to your breathing? Are you still breathing whilst you're in this process or are you holding your breath because you're letting in another human being. That's interesting. There were people here you know, people here you don't know. Seems to be more smiling as the moments pass. That's nice. Okay, so now let's just allow our eyes to lightly close. Settling into our meditation position. If you feel you need to move your body, then you could just stand up for a few moments if you like at the beginning of the practice. And when you're ready, we can settle. Settling back into the quality of awareness that we experienced in the previous sit maybe. Being aware of breathing. Seeing if we can rest inside, breathing inside the body again. So we're really settling into a stable sense of ourselves. Ourselves as a flow of experience, 
sensations arising and passing, breathing arising and passing. So a sense of self becomes more fluid, more open, pliable. And here's a beautiful poem from Bante Sankarachita, The Unseen Flower. Compassion is far more than emotion. It is something that springs up in the emptiness, which is when you yourself are not there, so that you do not know anything about it. Nobody, in fact, knows anything about it. If they knew it, it would not be compassion. But they can only smell the scent of the unseen flower that blooms in the heart of the void. So it's just staying centered and grounded. Let's expand the circumference of our field of awareness to include others. And something I've been enjoying doing on Zoom retreats is to imagine that all the people that are out there on the screen are coming to join me and we're in a big space. It might be a garden, it might be a field, it might be a big room, socially distanced, of course. But we're all three-dimensional flesh and blood, living, breathing humans together. There's people in front of me, behind me, around me and we're all together breathing, resting. And allowing one of these beings to come into sharper focus as it were. It might be somebody that we know on the retreat or it might be a face that particularly caught our attention. And just imagine breathing with that person in and out, in and out sharing this experience of embodiment, of presence. And spending some time really imagining what it might be like to be them in their body, that have quality of weight, just like we do, breathing, very like our own. They probably have pain at times, they'll have pleasure at times. They'll have the whole range of emotions showing up in the body just like we do. So if we can care about that person as much as we care about ourselves.
breathing in awareness of them in their fullness on the in-breath and breathing out kindliness, well-wishing towards them on the out-breath. Everything we wish for ourselves, we can wish for this person. So we're not denying our experience of self. That's still there. There's a flow, breathing, present, embodied. But we're including this other person in our awareness. Shifting away from being preoccupied with ourselves to really attending to this other person in their humanity. And now let's broaden out to include all of us. Seeing if we can shift from perceiving other as object to perceiving other as a human being just like oneself. So we're surrounded by all these rich, alive, humans, all breathing, all embodied, with all the drama and complexity of that experience. Breathing in awareness, breathing out kindliness and well-wishing to all of us. Drinking all these people in on the in-breath, love and kindliness pouring out towards them on the out-breath. Now bringing the weight of the body to the foreground of awareness, feeling into the points of contact, the stability, the body on the surface, which it's resting upon, breathing in the whole body, fluid, yielding, present, brave.
When we're ready, we can bring the practice to a close, moving gently with the breathing, just noticing any tendency to grip as soon as we think the meditation's ended, seeing if we can keep the flow of awareness going, open, soft, strong. Moving the body, however the body is calling for. So it's half past 12 and I'm very aware that some of you are navigating other responsibilities. So I don't want to run over because that would feel like taking the not given. Um, but at half past three, we're going to do a similar practice. We're going to do a, a five stage Metta Bhavana with this attitude of deep connection and um, bringing others to life. And then of course, you'll have your groups this afternoon where you can also share anything that you've noticed more deeply um, with the people in your group, for those of, those of you who are choosing to be in a group. Um, so I think we'll just leave it there. And if people have got 